so good to see you guys this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with me and let's sing glory to God as we begin our worship service today. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to me, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, the throne of all things. Angels of the sage cry out, we join them as we sing glory. to God forever. Amen. Seat. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I, I like that enthusiasm. Me too. I love it. Um, so good to see the smiles on your faces. We've had a great first service and I hope you guys had a great time in small groups. Um, if you're a first time guest with us today, we want to welcome you. I've met some of you as you came in the door. Thank you for being here. In your bulletin, there's a little section called Guest Information. We would love for you to fill that out. Drop it in the offering plate at the end of the service. That could be your gift to us, just so we can know who you are and kind of thank you. We actually have some gifts for you. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, if you'll meet us right outside the Welcome Center at the end of the service, we'd love to give those to you and just love on you and just kind of meet you and find out who you are and thank you for being here. So I hope you come ready to worship today. Um, I know our men that went to the men's conference in Atlanta uh, Friday and Saturday just got back last night. We had a great time. Thank you all for praying for us. It was a joyous time. I'm looking forward to next year already because here's my goal. We're going to take 60 men. Right? I, I got one amen from that. I won. That was you. I want to take 60 men next year to our men's conference uh, down in, in, in at Woodstock, Georgia. So I encourage you to be thinking about that, men. Um, it was enlightening for all of us that went. Um, we had some great stories along the way. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Thank you for praying for us. Again, um, today we have an incredible opportunity to come to the Lord's table. And uh, just what an incredible opportunity we have as Christians to kind of remember 
what Jesus Christ did for us. So I encourage you as we sing this next song, as we pray, to be thinking about your life. Be thinking about where you stand with the Lord. Think about this past week. Maybe think about this past month. Maybe the past several months. How's your walk with Jesus Christ going? How's it going? There was a question that was asked in our men's conference that really spoke to this culture. It said, are you spending more time with God in his word and in prayer than you are on a screen? It's a convicting question. And so as we continue to worship today, I want us to pray. I want us to think about that. I want us to think about our walk with the Lord. God, we come to you this morning realizing that we're nowhere where we should be with you. But God, we have a desire to draw closer to you. We have a desire to be more like you. So God, just this morning as we worship, this morning as we come to you, as we sing your praises, I ask, Lord, that you will kind of help us to evaluate, help us to examine our hearts and our lives with you. Speak to us, Lord. Cleanse us, Lord. Purify us, Lord. Make us more like you, Jesus. What an opportunity we have this morning to come to your table, and so we're thankful for that. And I just pray, Lord, that as we sing and as we praise and worship you, God, that our hearts will be in the right place as we come to your table in just a few minutes. So God, speak to our hearts, guide us and lead us. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's sing this song. And it's okay to not sing, too. If you need to do some self-evaluation, just ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts in preparation for taking the Lord's Supper. By grace alone, somehow I stand Where even angels fear to tread Invited by redeeming love Before the throne of God above He pulls me close With nail-scarred hands Into His everlasting arms When condemnation grips my heart And Satan tempts me to despair. I hear the voice that scatters fear. The great I am, the Lord is here. Oh, praise the one who finds. His perfect, spotless righteousness. A thousand years, a thousand times, are not enough to sing His praise.
I'd ask you to go ahead and have a seat. We have an incredible, awesome opportunity this morning to come to the Lord's table. And I know the Word teaches us that before we do that, we need to examine ourselves. We need to kind of do some self-evaluation. I said that earlier. Some of you have been thinking about that as we sang that beautiful song, Boldly I Approach the Throne. And that's the cool thing about Jesus. Is we can just boldly come into his presence. We can just boldly kind of just show up in his arms, in his majestic wide open arms. And we can just say, God, here I am. And I know probably if you're like me, you've probably had some times this week where you've messed up. You said the wrong thing, you thought the wrong thing, and maybe you you need to kind of spend some time in prayer just going, God, I really want to come to your table with a pure heart, clean hands. And so I just want to pray for us before we come to the Lord's table. The music's just playing softly. I want us just to bow our heads and pray. God, just in the stillness and the quietness of this moment, we just want to thank you. For your grand narrative in the the Bible that talks about how you sent your son Jesus to be the redemption of our sins. To die on the cross, a cruel death. To have your body broken. To have your blood shed for us. And God, in just a few moments we have the opportunity, the incredible opportunity to come and to follow your example that you laid out for us in that upper room that night take this bread that symbolizes your body, to take this cup that symbolizes your blood, and to just have a time of remembrance of that incredible atoning sacrifice you did for us on the cross. But God, before we do that, we just ask that you'll search us. That God, you'll look down deep into the recesses of our souls. Lord, those areas where we've Maybe not treated our spouses the right way. Maybe those areas we haven't treated our kids the right way. Maybe those things that you've allowed us to look at or view or say that's been unpleasing to you. God, I pray that you will forgive us of those things. And that God, as we come to the table, we'll come in a heart of purity. We'll come in a heart that desires to be more like you. So God, we ask that you will do just that right now. That you'll just examine us. That as David prayed, you will search us. If there's anything offensive in us, God, that you will reveal that to us so that we can come to your table with a pure heart, clean hands. God, we love you. and We we pray this all very boldly in your name. Amen. I think it's necessary to kind of take us back to to that upper room that night before Jesus went be arrested he was around his disciples the men that he had poured into for some three years and i'm sure they didn't know exactly what was going on and the bible says that jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave each of the disciples a piece of bread and said this is my body which is broken for you and i'm sure they they probably didn't know exactly what that meant they weren't exactly sure what was about to happen but just because Jesus asked him to do that they did that and after that in the same manner the Bible says he took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me <laughs> and I'm sure again the disciples were kind of wide-eyed and kind of, what, what is he talking about what does this all mean that's what the disciples did and that's what Jesus asked us to do and when we do this here at Leoma Baptist Church we take this very seriously I was praying this morning about 5 15 this morning just here in this front pew knowing we were going to have the Lord's Supper praying for each of you praying for me praying for my family I don't want to take this lightly this is what Jesus Christ did for us Jesus' body was broken for you, for me, for your sins, for my sins, past, present, future. He shed his blood so that we wouldn't have to. He went to the cross so we wouldn't have to. 
so I'm going to invite every Christian in the room. If you're, you don't have to be a member of our church to come. If you're a born-again believer, if you believe in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to come and partake of the Lord's table. You can come as a family. You can come individually. You can come with your spouse. You can grab your kids. You can come with a friend. And as you come, I encourage you just to take the bread, take the cup. There's plenty for everybody. You can come to either table. It doesn't matter. We've got three tables up here. We want you to take your time. If you want to pray at the altar as a family, you can do that. If you want to just kind of take some time and pray right there where you are, you can do that. But I want you to take the bread. I want you to take the cup. Just at your leisure, at your kind of pace that you want to do. Jared's going to play some just beautiful background music. If you just want to worship the Lord, if you want to pray, if you just want to kind of get together as your family and just pray, you can do that. But I encourage you to come to the Lord's table. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that every time we eat this bread, and every time we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. As we learned at the men's conference, I was saved when I was 12 years old. I've never gotten over it. I don't want you to get over your salvation. And this is a time where you can remember what it's about. What it means. What Jesus did for you. So, at your leisure, when you feel ready, you just come. You can come. Whether you're a member or not, you can come. And come to the Lord's table. Amen? Come as we sing. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King Hear the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ to condescend To call flesh to ransom Behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he Slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is what Jesus did for us. The Bible says that Jesus gave the bread and gave the cup to the disciples. It says they sang a hymn. Now most of you know the rest of the story. Jesus went out to the garden where Jesus was arrested. And the rest of the story is they went to the cross for us. Had that body was broken, that blood was shed. So I'd like for us to do just that. I'd like for us to do what the disciples did that night in the upper room. I'd like for us to sing a hymn. Will you stand with me? And Jared's just going to lead us in a hymn. Let's sing together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh. 
the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, that is our prayer and our praise today. That there's nothing good that we could have done to gain access back to God. It is only by the blood of Jesus. And we remember that today. We remember the suffering and the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died a literal death a cruel and agonizing death on a cross that each one of us should have borne. But you did it for us, Jesus. You loved us enough to, uh, to submit yourself to death. But praise God you didn't stay there. Three days later, you declared victory over death victory over the curse that sin had brought on this earth when you rose from the grave. And we praise you for that, Lord. Thank you for all that you endured for us so that we could become children of God. Lord, may you be pleased in us with our worship. May you be pleased in us as we continue to worship through the preaching of your word. We pray this in the name of of Jesus, our Savior, the Lamb who was slain. Amen. 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 Well, we are in our missions emphasis week. We, uh, obviously, if you've been aware of what's going on in our church, next weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday will be our missions Week and, and I wanted to kind of kick that off this Sunday with this series called Shine. It's, it's important for us to shine. And let me kind of just remind you of what's going on in the next couple of days. I want all of you to be a part of that. I want you to bring a friend. I want you to bring your friends and family and neighbors. Um, we are this coming Friday, this coming Friday night at 6 o'clock down in the multipurpose building. We are going to have our international banquet. That has always been a fun event here at our church. We do that annually. Um, we get people to make dishes from all over the world, Chinese dishes, Japanese dishes, Romanian dishes, uh, Hungarian dishes, Greek dishes, German dishes, desserts, all those things are good. There's some good, you know, German desserts out there. So uh, make sure that you sign up for those, bring those, have those here by 545. We'll start eating at 6. It's a big feast. I encourage you to come and be a part of that Friday night at 6 o'clock. There's sign-ups in the Welcome Center to do that. Um, we also, on that evening, you get to meet two or three of our missionary guests that will be here with us this weekend. You'll get to hear their story. I'll interview them. You'll get to know more about their ministries. All of our miss missionaries will have their tables set up around the perimeter of the gym downstairs. And so I encourage you to be a part of this Friday night. Then Saturday night, all of our small groups, I know they've been planning today. Saturday night, we've combined a couple of small groups together in five different locations. Some of them here, some of them are in homes. And you're going to have that so a different missionary in your small group to kind of you know kind of share a devotional, kind of share about their, their their mission, what they're doing, for you guys to be able to pray for them and, and interact with them on a small group level. So I encourage you to be a part of that on Saturday night at six o'clock as well. And then obviously Sunday next Sunday morning at both services we'll have our missions emphasis. Um, we'll receive our annual missions offering. I'll encourage each family here to be praying about what. You're going to be giving to the missions offering. Our goal this year is $30,000 above and beyond our tithes and offerings. I encourage you to be praying about what you're going to give to missions. All that money goes to spreading the gospel all over the world in a lot of different areas. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. I encourage you to be, and in your small groups next Sunday, you'll have a different missionary in front of your small group kind of sharing their story. So again, it's about exposure to you for, with the missionaries. It's also exposure for them, for you guys you could be praying for them and encouraging them in their walk with the Lord. So I encourage you to be here 
for Missions Week next weekend. And folks, our theme, as I said, is shine. Folks, listen. It's important for us to shine. Amen? It's important for us to shine here in this church. It's important for us to shine in our schools, in our workplaces. It's important for us to shine in our state, in our country, and in our world. Let our light so shine before men. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And here's what happens. I think mission work gets somewhat marginalized in our culture today. I think what happens is is we just kind of kind of shrink it down. It's just a little compartment of what we do at a church. And you know, I, my hope in this week and next week is that that missions kind of becomes rekindled in your heart and in your soul. That that missions is something that's not just a part of what we do once a year or what we do when we send missionaries out to another country. It is something that's going to be the DNA of who you are. So I pray that this missional flame will just kind of burst into wildfire inside your heart and inside your soul this week. Um, folks, we are supposed to let our, sh- our light shine. By the way, missions is not anything new. It's not something a bunch of Baptist pastors got together and invented. Okay, I want you to understand that. Missions is something that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. I'll get to scripture, I promise. Okay, in the big picture of God's kind of big redemptive plan, his narrative of the Bible, if you remember, Adam and Eve were created and they sinned. And that brought sin into this world. And what happened is God, listen, God pursued us in our sinfulness. Amen to that, right? He pursued us in our sinfulness. And so as a result of that, uh, those of you who are saved in the room today, those of you who are believers in the room, those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what happens is once he saves us, he then calls us to participate in the mission effort. He's called every single one of us to do that. So when I think about missions, it's, folks, it's not a new idea. It's not something that's happened just kind of in the last couple of years. This has happened from the beginning. This is God's calling to you to participate in it. And folks, listen, listen, listen. Missions is not something we dread. It is a privilege. It is an honor. It, it, is, it is an incredible opportunity that God gives us to be sharers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And folks, we would not be here today if it weren't for the missional efforts of people that's gone before us. Ironically, today is Leoma Baptist Church's 107th birthday. One hundred and seven and a half years ago, three ladies had a dream, had a vision for building a church and starting a church right here in Leoma. And people thought they were nuts. They're crazy. But because of their missional efforts, this church has been established for a hundred and seven years. Year. So this, this morning, I want us to kind of think about that. This morning, I want us to think about missions. I'm going to answer a couple of questions. First, the question is, why missions? We're going to answer that question. The second question is, how do we make a difference? We're going to answer that question. So let, let's talk first of all about how or, or why missions. Because, listen, when I used to, when I was younger, and maybe, maybe you think this way, when I was younger, I used to think that mission work was, was for specialists. You know, I used to think that almost like special forces, maybe in the army, you know, they, they were specialists. They could do special things that, no, that the normal soldier could do. And I always kind of thought mission work was for specialists. And then as I grew older and as I matured in my faith, I realized and I understood that the mission work that God has called us to do is, listen, it's for everybody. It's for every single man, woman, boy, and child that's a Christian. If we have confessed faith in Jesus Christ, then guess what? Guess what? You are a missionary. Say it to yourself. I am a missionary. That's what you are. You're a missionary. But, but, but the question comes is how do I participate in mission work? How do I do this? Do I, do I go? Do, do, I, do I send people? Do I give money to send people to go? Do I just sit back and pray? What do I do? Do I choose one of those to do, go, send, or pray? Listen, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that all of us, listen, All of us are called to pray. 
all of us are called to give money and send people. And all of us are called to go. Either part-time, full-time, across the street, across the ocean, we're called to go. All of us. And so this comes from, am I just kind of making this up? Is this this Pastor David's opinion? No. This comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. If you have your Bibles, turn there. This is a great passage of Scripture that, that we kind of just brush through sometimes. It's called the Great Commission. It's, it's, it's words from Jesus Christ himself that kind of tells us what we're called to do. Here's what it says, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is the words of Jesus. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Just by the way, if Jesus has all the authority in heaven and earth, you need to listen to what he has to say. Amen? And so this is what he says. He says, therefore, therefore, because I have all authority, therefore, because I'm in control, therefore, I am a sovereign God, therefore, he says, therefore, verse 19, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. Oh, I love this passage of Scripture. Right before Jesus is getting ready to be taken up to be with his Father in heaven. These are some of his last words given to his disciples. He gives this great commission. He says, go and make disciples. Folks, let me just kind of, just newsflash. This is a big deal. Making disciples is a big deal. It, it, it is the heart. Listen, it's the heart of Jesus. This is, what, this is what Jesus wanted the disciples to know more than anything else he had taught. He didn't care if they could turn water to wine. He didn't care if he could heal, they could heal leprosy. He just wanted them to know, look, you've got to go and make disciples. This is his heart. This is, this is what resonated in the heart of Jesus. This is, listen, listen this, I'm just going to make it real. This is more than just being a Christ follower. This is more than just sitting in a padded pew going, amen, brother, you preach it. If this is more than singing worship songs. This is more than giving a tithe or offering. This is the calling of every single Christian. It, and if you've heard this a few times, and I'm sure you've heard it preached on, and if you've heard it read, and you've heard it taught on, you probably know that the main verb in that passage, is not go. Go is not the main verb. The main verb is make disciples. And so uh, literally it, it, it says, it's as we are going, make disciples. So, so I want you to understand, there's an assumption here, there's an assumption that every Christian is already going. And you guys are going. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't go from your house to come here, right? You're going. So as you are, you went to Walmart, you went shopping, you went to the ball field, you, you've been gotten your hair done, you're going all the time. As you are going, make disciples. And not just here, the Bible says, not just here, but in all nations. So I think as we talk about all ethnic groups, all, all different countries, different languages, different cultures, all nations. And so, folks, we are called to be, to make, we are called to make disciples. This is such a big deal here at our church. Here, this is the mission statement of our church. If you're new to our church, you need to know this. Our whole purpose of existing as a church is, guess what? To make disciples. For the glory of God. That's it. That's what we hear. That's, we're not here to bake cookies. We're not here to have the Girls Club and Boys Club of America. We're not here to do Disney World trips. We're here to make disciples for the glory of God. Amen. That's the purpose of our church. It's a that big of a deal. So the question maybe comes is how does this apply to the context of here in 2020 here today? How does this apply? I think for order for us to understand this, let's understand a couple of terms in this Great Commission. Let's understand, let's understand the term nations. What does nations mean? I mean, we think nations, we think different countries, right? But really, nations is a Greek word for people groups. And you probably heard that term people groups. Not necessarily other countries, but different people groups. In other words, a group of people who have no barriers 
in language or culture. And look like, kind of like us. We're a people group. I had no problem communicating with any of you all today. I was able to say, hello, how are you? And you were able to say back to me, I'm good, how are you? We were able to communicate. We had the same language. We kind of understand culture. None of you kind of dressed in kind of a weird thing. Everybody kind of dresses alike. We have the same culture. We have the same language. We're a people group. And then there's this term we need to understand is, is unreached people groups. An unreached people group is a group where in that people group there is no indigenous church that has any amount of numbers or any amount of resources that can help spread the gospel in that people group. That's an unreached people group. And just so you can get your head kind of wrapped around the magnitude of this great commission that I've just read from Matthew 28. Just so you can get your head wrapped around it, I want you to listen to some statistics that come straight from the last part of 2019 from the Joshua Project, which is a, a term, a, a group that kind of does world missions. There are over, ready for this, there are over 17,307 people groups in the world. 17,307 people groups in the world with different cultures, different languages. That represents, if you know the world population, about 7.6 billion people. That's the world population. Now here's what's interesting. Over 7,000 375 of those people groups, 7,375 of those people groups are considered to be unreached. That, that, that represents 3.1 billion, with a B, people. That, that, that's... That's 3 point, well, listen, with all the technology we have, with all of the, the, the ways of spreading, you know, information, with all the means of transportation we have, there are 3.1 billion people in this world that are unreached, without hope, without eternal life, with Jesus Christ. <laughs> did, did you hear what I just said? 3.1 billion people lost have never been to church, have never heard the gospel. 3.1 billion people. And, and most of these, most of these 7,375 people groups that represent about 3.1 billion people. Most of them live in an area, what we call the 1040 window. And I've got a map of the 1040 window that I want to show you. You can kind of see it on the screen. This is, this is 10 degrees and 40 degrees north of the equator. And, and you can see it kind of encompasses most of North Africa. It includes most, a lot of Asia, it's Japan, all these parts of Japan. And, and this, is, this, is, this is this 1040 window. This is where most of these people groups that are unreached live. And I want you to understand something here. That what does this mean to all of us? What is this? I want you to just leave this map up here. I want you to kind of let that settle in for you a minute, okay? Because some of you have never been to that little red area, the 1040 window. Some of you have never been there. Some of you have been there. And I want this to kind of resonate with you because I want you to understand what does all this mean? What do all these numbers mean? What do all these statistics mean? It means this. The Great Commission is not finished. It's not finished. It's still occurring, it's still standing, God is still moving in the hearts of people. And what makes this even more difficult with this little red line here, this 1040 window, what makes this even more difficult is most of these countries are, are, are what's considered a restricted country. Some would even say they're closed countries, and mean, meaning they could, it's impossible to even get there. You can't go there, you just can't. And so I want you to understand that, that that's what's happening. But I also want you to understand, back in the Apostle Paul's days, remember those back in those days when you read Apostle Paul, and he's going here and he's going there? I want you to understand, that term, restricted country, didn't exist back in the Apostle Paul's days. And in fact, if we hear it today, we hear restricted country, but oh, I'm, not, I'm not going there. We, we can't do that. We can't go there. Too dangerous. And I want you to understand, that's what we think, but for Paul... If you'd have used that term restricted country, 
You know what? It would have never registered in his mind. Because Paul believed that when God opens a door, he just opens a door. And he walked through it. Now, some of you, I know I can see your heads spinning, your heads are turning, because the reality is this. The reality is, yes, most of these countries, most of these lost 3.1 billion people are in this 1040 window. Most of those countries are restricted countries, and, and it's very hard to get in there. So, yes, there's complications. And so not only is it hard to get in there, it is really, really, really hard work once you get there. In fact, you may die. I mean, many people that live in this, I want you to understand this, many people who live in this 1040 window, folks, have never, ever met a Christ follower. <laughs> they, 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 they've never read the Bible. They, they've never heard the gospel. And I don't know about you, but these are just eye-opening statistics for me that should move our hearts to action. It should move us to do something. That this, this kingdom mission work needs to continue in our day. So I'll go back to my question, why missions? I'll get to that, I promise. I mean, because when you think about the context of our day. Listen, we need, to, we need to know there are people in that red area. There are people that are Christians that are in that red area that are dying, that are being executed, that are being beheaded because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so why do I say this? Why, 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 because listen, listen, what I'm saying is I don't want you to look at the Great Commission the same ever again. I want you to know that it demands everything. Everything. It's really quiet today. This great commission always has demanded everything, and it always will demand everything. Let me just kind of say it real in a clear way. I'll put it in your notes this way. The call to missions is really this. It's a call, listen, it's a call to die. So that others may live. That's what mission work is all about. If you strip it all away, if you take missions and strip all the mission weeks away and all the cool short-term trips and all the things, the plane rides and all the flags that we collect, if we strip it all down, it really means that you're willing to lay down your life and die. Listen, you're willing to lay down in life, your life and die for somebody you don't even know. For somebody, listen, for somebody, I'll go further than that. For somebody who's actually hostile towards you. So that they may live. That's, that's mission work. It's, it's a difficult calling. It's maybe seemingly impossible calling. But it's exactly what God has commanded us and engaged us to be a part of. And so if we're serious about following Christ, this, this, this whole phrase of pick up your cross and carry, you know, carry your cross and follow me kind of has a new meaning. And to be honest with you, this is not an easy sermon to preach. Some of you thought, oh, great commission, I've heard that before. Okay, what kind of message will this be? Folks, this is not easy. Because it demands everything from you. It's a call for you to die. Oh, I see my son. I see my daughter. I see my friends, I don't want you to die. I love you. But this call is pretty, pretty difficult. So why missions? Let me kind of give you some reasons for missions. These are in your handout. Because missions is about worship. Missions is about worship. In fact, John Piper says it this way. He says, missions exist because worship does not. I mean, think about that. When, when God's grand narrative comes to an end and we are in glory in heaven with our Savior, Jesus Christ, guess what is going to cease to exist? Missions. <laughs> Nobody in heaven is going to be talking about, where are you going on a mission trip next year? Are you going, are you going, are you going to Romania next year? You know, nobody's going to be talking about that. There's no more missions when we get to heaven. But what's going to continue to exist for eternity is worship. We're going to be worshiping our Lord Jesus. And Savior. So parents, listen carefully. I'm going to be really, really clear. Parents, listen. 
We want to instill in the hearts of your children a burden for missions. Now, I, 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 I heard some amens and I heard some yeses, but I don't know if you heard what I said. <laughs> we want to instill. Avery, come here a minute. Can you stand with me for a minute? How old are you, Avery? Ten years old. Can your brother, can, you want to come up here and stand with me? How old is your brother? Four. He's four. We want to instill in Toby and Avery burden for missions. My hope one day is that you'll look at your mom and your dad and you'll say, Mom, Dad, Dad, God's called me to Afghanistan. I'm serious. And I, I hope mom and dad can say, we're praying for you. When you go, and we're going to be praying. I hope they don't say, thank you guys, I appreciate that. I hope they don't say, no, that's too dangerous. You're not going there. Can't you go anywhere else? Isn't there some mission trips in Aruba? Parents, my hope is this church instills in your children a passion, a burden for missions. And I don't know about you, Chad and Hannah, that's hard for a parent. It's hard. Because I don't, I don't want my kids to be in an unsafe place where they might die. I love my kids, but I love my Savior more. And he's called us to this great commission. It's about worship it's about relentlessly pursuing not listen it's not about relentlessly pursuing the american dream for our kids it's about pursuing the mission of god here's another reason why why missions we know that salvation comes through christ and christ alone we know that right we know this to be true it's not listen missions is not just about the poor kid in 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 some country that's starving to death that looks like skin and bones on tv that's not what missions is about. Missions is about one thing, salvation. That's what missions is about. Missions is about salvation and salvation through Christ and in Christ alone. And folks, just because this 1040 window is full of people that have been unreached, it's not God's fault. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. It's our task. We've been commissioned by God in Matthew 28 to go and preach the gospel to all the nations. There are thousands and thousands of people dying every single day without Christ because we have become too comfortable. John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not the four noble truths. It's not what's in the Quran. It's not you know, the gods that Hindu serves. It, it, it's, it's through Jesus. Here's a third reason why missions. Missions is our identity, right? It always has been our identity, always will be our identity. It's who we were created to be. Missions is our identity. Here's another reason. I love this reason. There is no greater joy than making God's glory known. There's a man by the name of uh, Adoniram Judson. He, he, he was 22 years old when God called he and his pregnant wife to the mission field to Burma. Now, I'll, I'll give you kind of the end of the story. Judson was able to establish about 63 churches and personally led 6,000 Burmese people to faith in Christ. But I want you to understand something. It was not easy. In fact, when Judson and his pregnant wife got to the dock at Burma after on this long boat ride, they would not let them in the country for three weeks. They were cast out to sea on this boat for three weeks. She actually delivered her first baby on that boat, and the baby died. I'd have given up. I'm going back home. Not Judson. He actually 
he and his wife actually got to the country of Burma that, you know, they got there and got to Burma and six and a half years preached the gospel. Six and a half years preached the gospel and not one soul came to know Jesus. Not one. Not one. In that time, his wife had three more kids. In that time, Judson was thrown into prison. Not just thrown into prison, but was hung by his legs upside down in prison so that only the back of his shoulder and his head would rest on the floor for a week. He had to eat, sleep, pray, and yes, use the restroom in that position. His wife and three kids all died in Burma. He remarried. Had two more kids with his second wife. They all died in Burma. Judson finally died by himself. On a boat out to sea. But today, right now, 2020, there are 3,700 churches in Burma that trace their beginning to Judson. A man who, who never gave up. A man who had plenty of opportunities, who had plenty of, of reason to just quit and go home. His, his financial backers even said to him, look, why don't you just come back home? It's too hard. It's impossible. But he kept going. He kept moving. He kept understanding the Great Commission in the back of his head. He knew that's what God had called him to do. And he never gave up. Why? Because to him, there was no greater joy than to make the glory of God known to mankind. Listen, I want you to understand something. Missions is never, ever, ever driven by guilt. Missions is driven by joy. Missions is driven by worship. I, I hear people say at our church, why are we going overseas where there's so many lost people here in Lawrence County? Do you read God's word? Does anybody read God's word? Really? That's not driven by joy. Unbelievable. I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm embarrassed today. I'm embarrassed that I've already announced that our, our goal for our missions offering is only $30,000. There's some people in this room that could give $30,000 today for missions. Pastor, you're stepping on some toes. Yep. But it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's all in. It, 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 it makes you give your everything, right? So the question is, if that's why we do missions, if that's why, so how, maybe the question is, how do I make a difference? How do we as a church, how do we make a difference? Well, that, that, the answer to that question is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Don't, don't miss this. 1 Peter 3, 15. I'm getting somewhere. Follow me, right? 1 Peter 3, 15. Here's how you make a difference. It says, Peter says this. Now, remember, remember Peter? Remember Peter? He, he was the guy who always opened his mouth and inserted his foot. He loved the Lord, but he continued to cuss. He continued to fight. He continued to swing the sword, right? He continued to do all that stuff, right? That's Peter. Finally, Peter gets it. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, he writes these two books, First and Second Peter. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Here's how you make a difference, church. I'm going to answer that question. Here's how you make a difference. We make a difference with the hope that we have. 
We make a difference with the hope that we have. Peter here is saying that this is how you are to be a witness. This is how it works. This is how we, you do it with the hope that we have. Look back at verse 14 of that scripture, 1 Peter 3, 14. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. I believe that's what Judson had in his mind. I'm not going to be frightened. I'm not going to fear their threats. I'm just going to keep going. Peter's saying here, you don't, you don't have to fear the suffering. You don't have to fear the threats. In fact, when you get into that moment, when you get into that moment where you're fearing and you're going through trials and you're going through tribulations and you want to quit and give up, you have an answer. You have an answer that's already available. And this is the amazing thing. People, listen, lost people are going to ask you, What's this hope you have? Well, what is this about you? How can you go through what you went through? Some of you were thinking when I was talking about Judson, you were thinking, I would have quit and gone home a long time ago. Why did he continue? Because he had a hope. He had a hope that was beyond anything. And so how do you make a difference? You make a difference. Listen, you don't make a difference by saving people. We have never on a mission trip here saved anybody. Because that's God's work. That's God's work. God does that. The work of salvation belongs to Christ. But listen, you make a difference when you demonstrate the reality of Jesus in your life to other people. And you live your life in such a way that there's a hope that people want to know more about. This is how you live it. I mean, you can make a difference with the hope that you are holding on to. Peter, Peter says here, look, people are watching you. They're watching how you live. They're watching what your dreams are. They're watching what you aspire to be. They're watching how you raise your kids. They're watching how you spend your time. They're watching how you spend your money. They're watching every single thing you do. And something inside of how you behave and how you act and how you go about your life, there needs to be, there needs to be such a radical difference than everything else they see in the world. That the only thing they can do is say, can you please tell me what this hope is you have? That's how we're supposed to live. That's how we make a difference. Your dreams, your goals, that's your hope, right? What, what you do, that, that's your hope. And folks, listen, we've got to be so different that the lost and dying world is good. And Peter, Peter I, I'm almost done. Peter gives kind of three descriptors for this hope. In First Peter, don't miss this. If you if you back up to First Peter, chapter one, verses three and four, he, he calls it he calls it, he calls it a living hope, not a dead hope, not a dumb dream that's never going to come. No, this is a living hope. He says this in verse three: Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into this inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's a living hope, folks, because Christ, newsflash, newsflash, Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive. It's a living hope. He, he describes it this way in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. We've already read that. But it's also, it's also, a, it's a fearless hope. It's a hope, it's a fearless hope that produces fearless joy. He, he says this, he says, look, when you suffer, you're blessed. He says, but some of you are going, how could suffering be a blessing? It's because you're, you're, you're not hoping in a, in a 401k. You're not hoping in a bank account. You're not, you're not hoping in that next job promotion. You're not hoping for that bigger house, that nicer car, that nicer truck, the more kids. You're not hoping any of those things in prosperity and contentment. You're hoping in Jesus Christ, who's alive. It's a different kind of hope. It's a hope that when you are fearlessly living that way, people are going to ask you what that hope's all about. The third way he describes it, it's a selfless hope. Don't miss this one. Don't miss this one, church. 1 Peter 3, 9. Let's go up just a few verses. It says this. 3, 9 of 1 Peter says this. Do not repay evil with evil 
or insult with insult. On the contrary, he says, repay evil with blessing. I want to repeat that, so make sure you write that down and you know that. Repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. <laughs> this is what we're called to. When people do evil things against you, bless them. When people lie about you, bless them. When people say mean and horrible things about you, do not repay evil with evil, but bless them. It's a selfless hope. And when you act that way, I promise you, people will ask, what in the world is wrong with you? Tell me what you got, because I want some of it. This is the difference we make. So maybe the question is, how, what does all this have to do with missions? What does all this have to do with us letting our light shine? What does all of this have to do with doing this three-day engineering camp that takes up so much time and energy for kids in our community? What does this all have to do with going to places like in the middle of nowhere like Idaho? Why are we going to Idaho? Why are we going to Romania? Why are we going to Peru and Cuba? Why are we going to all these places? What does it have to do with all of this? Because, folks, listen, our missions effort, listen, it's not about doing good works. It's about displaying this living hope. It's about people asking us what's different about you. It's about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and proclaiming his name until he comes again. That's what we're called to do. And so listen, I, I don't know about you, but as I've, I've, I've kind of studied through these stats and I've preached this now twice, I, I, my heart is just continuing to mourn over these unreached people groups. My heart continues to mourn about the lost people in our community. My heart continues to mourn about the lost people in my, ready for this, my neighborhood. The lost friends that my kids have at school. And I get it, I, I get it. Some of you cannot just physically get on a plane and go to Uganda. I get it. But you can go across the street. You can go to Walmart, you can go to Burger King, McDonald's. You can go to Brass Land and Needs, don't you? And, and, and you can take this hope, and you can live differently. And we all have the privilege of doing this. And so our heart, our heart of making disciples, maybe it just needs to, for some of us, just needs to start in the back yard. And folks, this is the difference we can make. This is the fuel for missions. Where's your heart today? How's that, how's that hope thing going in your life? Are, are, are you living your life at work, in your neighborhood, in front of your spouse, in front of your kids, in such a way that's different? What are your Parents, what are your kids seeing? And if you're here today and you're, and you're lost today, you, you, you don't know Jesus. Now, I would dare say that probably somebody in this audience today has never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. First of all, let me just say I'm glad you're here. But if you're lost today and you've never received Jesus Christ, that's the first step you need to make. That, that's the first thing you need to do is you need to kind of surrender your life to Jesus. It's the most incredible gift you'll ever receive. It will radically change your life. It will radically transform you and mold you and refine you into somebody you cannot even imagine. If that's you today, I'm just going to encourage you to maybe come and maybe grab me at the altar and say, hey, Pastor, I just, I just need to be saved. Listen, I will take as much time as we need to kind of walk you through that process. And, and here's what's cool about that. You don't have to do anything. Right, Al? Remember the old song, Jesus paid it all. I'm going to change it. Jesus did it all. He did every bit of it for you. 
And all you have to do, all you have to do today, if you're lost today, say, "You've done it for me. I'm, I want to surrender my life to you." But the rest of you, as Christians, the rest of us who are comfortable with our little church, the rest of us who are comfortable and just sitting in the same seat we've sat every single Sunday for the last 35 years, for those of us who are just you know we're comfortable and throwing that check, the same check in the offering every Sunday. We're, 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 you know, we're just okay with going to our salt mall group and, you know, we'll support things. We'll support our youth and our kids. My hope and my prayer is that for all of you, from young to old, there's a rekindling of your missional fire. And those unreached people, those 3.1 billion people who don't know Jesus will resonate in your heart maybe even keep you up at night praying seeking the lord what can i do where can i go who can i send how can i pray the bible says king jesus king jesus will come but king jesus is not going to come until this word has spread throughout the world We've got work to do, church. Some of you need to get some passports. Some of you need to be on the phone with United Airlines. Some of you need to be re-looking at your 401ks and redistributing some money so you can send somebody, maybe a grandson or a granddaughter, over to do some mission work at this 1040 window so that we can fulfill the Great Commission. You stand with me, pray. God, I <laughs> I don't know that I need to say anything more than just, God, will you convict hearts today in the life of this church? Lord, if there's a lost person here, I'm asking you, Lord, to bring them forward, to help them to kind of step out of the, the seat that they're sitting in and come down to this altar today and just look me in the eye and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. And God, by doing that, they're, they're just acknowledging that they're surrendering their life to you. And God, we'll walk them and we'll put them on the road to discipleship. But God, I'm also praying that today, in this, in this moment of invitation, this moment where we're going to sing a song, we're going to just kind of wait on you. God, I pray that for Christians in this room, as we've come to your table, as we've recognized what you have done for us, well, you, we've recognized your body that was broken, your, your blood that was shed on the cross for us. Lord, we also recognize what you've called us to do. And you've called us to the Great Commission. And so, God, may every fiber of our being be spent proclaiming you. May everything that we do, may the DNA of who we are be consumed with proclaiming you and sharing that hope, that, that, that living, fearless, selfless hope. And God, I pray that you will just convict hearts today. God, I know that you're working in different people's hearts and minds in different ways. Lord, right now, will you allow them to kind of make that next step and do something about it? Maybe they need to get saved. Maybe they need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe they need to kind of surrender to ministry. Maybe they need to kind of think about what their missions offering is going to be next week. Maybe they need to think about the person next door, the person down the street, the person in Syria, the person in North Africa that needs you. God, will you work in the hearts and lives of our people this morning? And I pray that you'll bring us to a moment of decision this morning. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Come.